Let's move on because at the weekend, uh, Mo Farah won the marathon in uh, two hours and five minutes. And um, today, the English media have decided that he is um, Team GB's best chance of a gold medal in the Olympic Games. There's an amazing piece in the uh, London Times this morning where they're talking about perhaps if he manages to do this, he's going to be the greatest runner of all time. And there's a reference to Usain Bolt with blisters. And he would then also be... Britain's greatest ever sports person with achievements like that. Let's, I mean, we have to talk about it, and I'm delighted to say we've got uh, Dr. Ross Tucker with us this morning. Ross, good morning to you. You actually got up and live tweeted this race, so, um, you know, you, you got to bear witness to a little bit of history at the weekend. Yes, the feel good story of my ferret. <laughs> keeps getting better. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit about the, just put some context on the performance. How, how, how good was the performance um, and how astonishing is it that somebody can actually just be this good at the marathon as quickly as Mo Farah has become good at the marathon? Yeah, it was, it was impressive because he, he ran the marathon the same way that he used to run the track and that was, you didn't see him for the first 30 kilometers and there were times when I even wondered whether he was actually feeling good on the day because he was nowhere to be seen at the front, very, very intelligent tactically. And then once things start to heat up, he's paying attention, he's at the front, and then for the last five kilometers, he dictates the race. So it was like superimposing a, a track race onto the roads of Chicago. So he, he did it the same as he's done on the track since, when would it have been? 2011, I think, was his first major world title, 2012 Olympics, 2016 Olympics. So the template that they've succeeded with on the track is obviously now going to work for them on the roads. Two hours and five odd minutes is also a pretty impressive time, right? Yeah, and, and that was off what was a relatively slow first half for them. It's two or three, uh, sorry, two or six pace through halfway, and so the second half was very quick, which suggests that there's more to come. So the talk in the media, while it is typically gushing and one-sided, is probably justified in the sense that he is likely to be their best medal chance at the 2020 Olympic Games, as long as he stays healthy. I can't see him not winning a medal in that marathon because, you know, those marathons don't have pacemakers. They're, they tend to be slow tactical affairs, and that's, that's where he excels. But he's also clearly got the speed to run fast if it's needed. So he will be very difficult to deny a medal. Whether he wins the gold medal, that's... That's another issue. So uh, this isn't his first marathon. This is just him kind of finally putting all the bits of the marathon together. Is that right? Yeah, he did the London one, which looked more for show initially a few years back, and then did London this year where he was much more impressive in what was quite a brutal race. The pace was maybe a little bit too quick for everyone there. And then this is the one where it's sort of come together. So he will now do, I assume, a marathon in London next year. I would imagine that would be a big payday. Another one in late 2019, and then and then the question will be how he looks for the 2020 Olympics. By then, he would be on his, if my maths are right, sixth marathon, which is about where you want to be. So, again, he, he looks like a good bet for a medal in 2020 at this point. Uh, physiologically, how unusual is it for someone of 35 years of age to pull out a performance like this, given the lack of marathon pedigree that Mo Farah has in the bank? Well, we've seen many top track runners make successful transitions to the marathon. So that's not unusual. Uh, you think back over the last decade, Gabriel Selassie, Turgat, um, even before them, the, the, the format used to be you used to run on the track until your speed declined and then you went up to the marathon. So that part of it is not surprising. As you say, the age thing is maybe a little bit surprising, but I don't know what to make of age anymore because it used to be that you used to peak in your early 30s and then used to disappear. Now we see some athletes are running their best performances in their early 20s and other athletes are running their best performances in their mid-30s. I mean, Gabriel Selassie, Wilson Kipchang, Kipchoge is 33 and running his 11th marathon a few weeks back when he broke the world record. So when it comes to these <laughs> these age predictions and, and, and patterns that used to exist, I think all bets are off these days. And I don't know why that is. Is that is that a doping thing? Like doping is all about recovery and regeneration. It could be. The cynic in me wonders. Is it a sports science thing that we've just learned how to manage and recover better? I, I, I don't know, but uh, it's, it's unusual, but it's also normal, a new normal. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm always interested to, um, like, uh, I mean, we're all fairly skeptical when it comes to any of the great events that we cover and the uh, amazing achievements that we see. But, like, what, what is the truth about where sports science has taken us in terms of what would a, a natural evolution of performance be? Is, is it, has it been a gradual curve or has actually, have, has sports science followed, say, um, I don't know, the, the speed with which we can now transfer data all around the world, the speed at which our computer processes information. Has sports science been going through a revolution at the same time as the doping revolution has happened? And is, is it impossible for us ever to know how far sports science has taken clean athletes? It, it is impossible to know that, but I will say with a fair amount of confidence that the progression and knowledge and the contribution that sports science makes to performance is considerably smaller than your analogy with data. So if the, if the acceleration in data transfer is this, then sports science is barely above the horizontal. And sports scientists obviously don't like to acknowledge that. And of course we know much more than we did in the 1980s and, and a little bit more the, than in the 1990s and mid 2000s. Of course we know that. But what you know is one thing, whether you can use it to transform performance is, is quite another. And the, for me, one of the most telling things is when you look at women's track and field athletics, those performances from the 1980s have not even been touched in the last 30 years. So all the innovation, all the knowledge, all the advances in nutrition, training, recovery, equipment, and we still haven't got close to some of those performances from the 1980s. And that's because the effect of doping was so enormous that it took them out of reach even for 30 years worth of progress to, to come close to. So... While I would not say that it makes no contribution, I don't think that it makes anything like the contribution many people would want people to believe that it does. And one of the places you see that is you look at cycling's one hour record. The moment they said we're going back to the equipment from the 1970s, that performance dropped from about 55 kilometers right down to where it was almost in the 70s. So human progress is not nearly as rapid as people would like to think. A lot of it's technology, and a big part of it, I think, is doping. Speaking of the technology, because obviously the, the two-hour marathon record is um, uh, one of those kind of iconic targets that has been created maybe a bit through marketing over the, the last number of years. But um, there have been attempts to use technology to improve the footwear that the runners are using as a means of shaving a certain amount of, of time off that record. What is the status of the specific runners that Nike have been vented to uh, try and help break this record, are they legal? Are, they, are we all going to be using them at some point in the near future? And is that something that there has to be some kind of agreement to go back to something, some, some specific random point in history and say, okay, anything that comes after that, you can't use? Well, they're legal, number one. That's because the policy that currently governs the use of equipment is so vaguely written that it's very difficult to apply it to make them illegal. Should they be illegal, I think, is a different question. My, my opinion is they should be because when you look at that record from Kipchoge a few weeks back, everyone was saying what a breakthrough for human performance, Kipchoge, what a great athlete, by far the greatest marathon runner who's ever lived. The, the problem is that Nike has told us that the shoe is worth 4%. Well, they've got some research showing 4%, and one can quibble about whether that laboratory study of 4% is actually worth 4% in a, in a race, but there's reason to suggest that it might be. New York Times did a study, or a massive survey, where they reckon that statistically it's worth about 1% compared to the next best shoe. So then when Kipchoge breaks the world record by 1.06%, which is what he did, the problem for people is that you have to choose. Are you going to celebrate Kipchoge the athlete or are you going to celebrate Nike the shoe manufacturer? Because the improvement in the world record, even conservatively, is exactly what he, what they are claiming the, the shoe would work on the, on the lower end of the spectrum for what the shoe is worth. So if that's true, then Kipchoge is no better than the guys five, six years ago, but he's just got a better shoe. Now, I don't think that that's a healthy situation for marathon running. And what I think has happened, and, and this is what I'm led to believe from people who've told me this, is that a number of the athletes are running in that shoe despite sponsorship agreements. They're, they're covering it up and they're trying to get away with it because everyone recognizes that this might be, I say might because I'm not yet 100% convinced that it does do what it claims to, 
but that it skews the results of performance to such an extent that unless you are in that shoe, you may not have a chance of winning or breaking records. And I think that situation has to be dealt with because otherwise everyone will be in those shoes within the next year or two, if they're not already. It's not quite the same, but it's not a million miles away from the swimsuits that everybody set the world records in that then all of a sudden became banned the year after. Yeah, it's very similar to that. And eventually what happened there was that other companies imitated the original, which was a Speedo suit. And within a year, almost the integrity of a swimming competition had been lost because the suits were helping some athletes disproportionately more than others. Some athletes had sponsorships that precluded them from having the suits. And eventually, unless you were in the suit, you couldn't win. And so the authorities took the decision to ban them. And I think that's, it, I think it's actually a very similar situation to what we are looking at now for, for running shoes. If we put uh, the Kipchoge record on these shoes and even just on kind of the development of sports science over the past couple of years, it is kind of astonishing when you look at the fact that it was a 78 second improvement on the previous record. We haven't seen that big an improvement on a record in over 50 years. Like, do you think that that's something that you look at and you think to yourself, well, fair enough, the way and the rate at which sports science is improving now uh, is at a greater rate than we've ever seen before, certainly in the last half a century? Or do you look at that figure and think, where the hell is that coming from? Yeah, the latter for me, because I know that sports science hasn't improved to the extent that it can take that much off what was already quite an, well, not artificially aided, although who knows, uh, an aided performance. I mean, what was said in 2014, we haven't, we haven't evolved as human beings in four years. Sports science hasn't developed to the extent, although people are claiming that it's a new energy drink, they're claiming that it's shoes. So I suppose some people would say that there is a contribution of sports science to that, but um we don't. We can't quantify them, and so we don't really know where we stand. It's a. This is the dilemma: is that no one knows how to interpret what they see because it could be the result of four or five, broadly speaking, different things, and you can't quantify any one of them. So, therefore, which one do you celebrate? And that's that was the point people I think missed was that you can't celebrate Kipchoge and the shoe at the same time, and you have to pick. It was one or the other. Yeah, I, I mean, just to, to go back to Farah, um, the, the London Times this morning are basically saying that if he does win a gold in the marathon, he'll be Britain's greatest ever sports person and that he would be the greatest runner of all time. And um, well, that would be a, a, an interesting late period of his career that we would all have to uh, get our heads around. Yeah, he, uh, imagine he'd started running this way when he's 21. <laughs> He would have won twice as many medals because this pharaoh emerged at the age of 26, which in itself is remarkable. So you've seen someone in seven years as a late developer go on and do all the things that he's done. And there's no question, if he does that, and if, <laughs> I'll go so far as to say, and if the full story doesn't emerge, he will go down as the most decorated running athlete in history. No athlete I can think of, I mean, I stand corrected, but... Who's won three distance medals at three consecutive Olympic Games? I don't think anyone has. He's done a double twice. If he adds a marathon Olympic gold in Tokyo, then statistically it would be very difficult to argue against that perception. But the, the, the story just, and this is opinion, the story just does not sit well with me because the transformation and all the dishonesty about his associations and relationships with coaches, Jama Aden, maybe primary among them, the Salazar investigation, the deceit about locations and TVs, it's just the, just the list of things to disbelieve Farah is so long that even though we can't say he's doping, we can say he's untrustworthy. And so it sits very uncomfortably with me when, when he's got a list of medals and titles as long as he has. Yeah, it's, I find it remarkable. If we take Bo Farah at face value, if we take uh, Kipchoge, the, the fantastic record, uh, at face value, it's actually, if you take all that at face value, it's laughable that we're even considering the possibility that the two-hour marathon won't be broken. Even if you put it into honest circumstances, not the one that Nike tried to virtually create last year, albeit falling short. Because you look at smashing that by 78 seconds, you look at Mo Farah turning into one of the greatest marathon runners without having huge pedigree in marathon running. Surely that record can be taken down a lot further if we're making these massive leaps in time in, in the year 2018. I know you've been on the record on the show previously saying, that physiologically we shouldn't be making these leaps but they're happening yeah and it, it seems at this point that it needs maybe two or three more little nudges and it'll be there so 
anyone who says that it's not going to happen or that they won't see it, I think, is uh, is deluding themselves. We will see a sub two. The question is when. And in the absence of any of these external factors, I still think it would have taken 30, 40 years. But I think the needle has been moved forward a little bit now. Um, I still wouldn't want to hazard a guess that it would happen in the next 10 years. For me, 2030, perhaps, is when we'll see it. But, but so much depends on on the call it the regulatory environment, and that applies obviously to doping and it applies to, in this case, the equipment. You said earlier on about um, uh, by the time the Olympics rolls around in Tokyo that Farah should be on his sixth marathon, that Kipchoge is on his 11th marathon. What is the actual, what is that spread of, of number of marathons that an athlete can actually do before they suddenly become an also ran? Yeah, so Kipchoge will be on, if he runs as expected three more, that'll be his 15th. Now, that's getting way over to the spectrum of where you should actually start to see the athletes in decline. I remember seeing a study that showed that athletes would peak in about their fourth or fifth marathon. So, and interestingly, that was irrespective of age. So if you started marathon running at 21, and if you started marathon running at 30, and even at 50, because this study looked at amateurs, hobby, <laughs> hobby marathoners. And what it showed was that your first marathon, you're learning, and then you improve and you improve. And by about the fourth or fifth one, you get to your best one. And then you start slowing down again. But in the elite athletes, this trend also seems to be a little bit violated or different in the last decade. Because as I said, some athletes are coming straight in and in their first or second race running as fast as they ever will. And then they disappear. Other athletes are coming in and then consistently running. And then by mid-30s, they run PBs. I can think of two or three, Kipchoge being one of them. So again, there was a rule of thumb which the current generation seems to have bucked. And so I don't know, I couldn't tell you, but I certainly, if I was, a, all things being equal, I'd bet on the guy running his sixth one ahead of the guy running his 15th. And is that, like, taking out any external, it, it's because the marathon is such a brutal thing on your body and psychologically, and it's so hard for you to kind of actually fully understand what the 26.2 miles actually means. Yeah, that that's sort of the main reason for it. Obviously, by the time you get into your mid-30s, you're dealing with the consequences of aging as well. Um, and just by the way, another athlete who's really bucked the aging trend was Justin Gatlin. Everyone else was getting slow in their 30s and Gatlin was getting faster. You look at Valverde in cycling, it's the same thing. In swimming, Phelps, there was a 40-year-old athlete winning an Olympic medal a few years back. So... What we used to know and think about aging, I think, has, has certainly been changed. But the short answer to your question is, is yes. It's just the 160 to 200 kilometers a week for 11 months of a year, the recovery after the marathon, and eventually you just lose the ability to do that and you, you start to slow down again, in theory. There was one other thing that we wanted to talk to you about, Ross. A, a campaign was launched yesterday by the Department of Health here. It's called Zero Gains, and it's to try and counteract um, what they say is widespread steroid use amongst um, Irish gym goers. This target is particularly Irish teenagers, but I mean it applies to um, largely, it seems, young males in their twenties uh, and thirties. Now, um, I I know of stories where uh, there are amateur cyclists getting completely off their heads on drugs to try and win uh, races on a weekend. Um, this seems to be a fairly widespread global phenomenon at the moment. Yeah, it's a huge thing. In South Africa, there's been every single year, there's some scandal around schoolboys and doping. There was a big study done where they surveyed 10,000 schoolboys in South Africa a few years back and they found a lifetime prevalence of 10%. So basically, one in 10 schoolboys will confess to doping. And you can imagine, even if half of them confess, the true number is one in five. So it certainly is a big problem. And, and one of the most interesting things about that study, and I imagine it's very similar to, to what's happening in Ireland, is when they ask those people, why do you use the steroids, performance is, is one of the lesser factors. The main thing, the most common by a considerable amount, is for appearance and aesthetics and to look good. And so that gym-going population that has such easy access to drugs through the gym community, because that's where they get it from, is their peers and their colleagues and the trainers and so forth who are making a buck on the side, that's a, it's a massive issue. So I'm not sure how one deals with it. I, I'm not convinced that education is the most effective way to do it, but I certainly think a campaign for awareness is important. So, as in the best way would be to try and 
somehow cut down on the supply like a, you know, yeah. you think generally about the war on drugs and how um, insignificant the results have been for the investment and just generally how criminalizing people involved in it hasn't made any dent in the general population's willingness to take drugs uh, it's very hard to know what to do with this yeah exactly and, and one of the reasons education often fails is because People are really terrible at making decisions today about the consequences that are delayed into the future. So in the 1980s and even the 70s, any campaign to tell people to not smoke because of the health risks of lung cancer, those were ineffective. The same thing now is you can tell someone don't eat that burger and those extra large fries and a supersized Coke because in 20 years time you might get uh, heart problems and liver disease and so forth. But people don't care about those because the outcome is so delayed. And one of the problems with anti-doping campaigns that focus on risk is that they're also trying to tell someone, don't do this because maybe in 10 years you'll see the consequences. That person is doping for the right now. They say, I want to look good in two weeks or two months. And so that's one of the problems is trying to change behavior with that message. So that's not to say that it's not important to do because I think if you're in a regulatory environment, maybe at some point you're saying we're never going to stop them from doping. So what we can do is we can educate and we can warn them so that we can suppress, lower the levels, and maybe where it was previously unsafe, we can bring it back down to what's a safe level, and that's, that in itself is a win. So perhaps that's, that's how we need to think a little bit about it. But the eradication of, of drug use through education for me is folly. Yeah, that, that's interesting because we often have this sort of theoretical debate about whether or not sport would be a more watchable thing in, in certain areas if everybody was allowed to use whatever they wanted to use. But do you think that there's enough information out there of these drugs that are being used illegally to actually protect athletes' well-beings if they were allowed to use whatever they used? Or is there a sort of a situation with a lot of these where there's still a lot of hidden elements to these drugs that can do a lot of long-term damage that we're still not quite, we're still not quite aware of yet? I think that in the elite sporting community, it's obviously much easier to get that information into that group because they're smaller and they're confined. You know where you'll find them and there's a, mess there's a message that you can deliver through known channels. You think about athletes are in teams, so therefore you send it through the league. When it comes to the recreational gym go, it's much more difficult. And so then the message gets diluted, it gets dispersed. And I would imagine, and I saw some of the, the articles about the, the, the project you're talking about there, is that about half of the people are ignorant around the, the risks around steroid use. So obviously there is a, a market that needs to learn a little bit about those risks. So I think it depends a little bit on, the, on who you're addressing in that instance. Elite athletes, I think a far smaller problem with education. For the masses, I think a far bigger one. But, and this is something I play devil's advocate a little bit, is I don't think anti-doping authorities should be worried about the community level of sport. For me, if, if the guy who works at the local bank wants to go and take some steroids to look good for summer, then that's, that's really not a sporting body's problem. It's a health issue. And so he needs to be helped in a health perspective, whereas in an elite sport environment, it's about anti-doping and integrity of sport. I think that's fair enough. Mm. Ross, always great to have you with us. Thanks a million for making the time for us this morning. No, as always, good to chat, Jens. Thanks very much.